Good morning and welcome to the broadcast today. Thank you for joining me, for joining us at the Mount Zion Church, and we're glad that you are part of the broadcast today. It's time for Sunday school, and it's beautiful outside. Last week it was beautiful with a little uh, rain, but this week no rain drops, just a clear sky, and we are making ready to worship outside. Now, some of you still have a reluctancy to be inside. I do understand that. And so we are accommodating you outside. You can drive up in the parking lot. You can uh, bring your lawn chairs. You can sit on the lawn. You can sit on the five uh, or so tents uh, out there. So uh, I hope you'll simply come to church and be with us today at 10 o'clock. Now, I'm getting right into the Word of God today because I'm talking about uh, calming the storm. You know, when the storms of life are raging, we need somebody to calm them down. And so we're going to be talking about calming the storm. Of course, there's somebody who is always able, capable, and willing to calm the storm. His name is Jesus. It's not me. His name is Jesus. And so stay right where you are. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27 is where our lesson is going to be found. And while you're turning to that, uh, tomorrow night we've got a Vacation Bible School uh, lesson from the West District. Join me right here uh, on Facebook and on Zoom on Wednesday evening. Uh, we've got uh, Vacation Bible School again, and we've got health initiatives from uh, local MDs, uh, both for adults and for pediatrics, and we've got mental health professionals, uh, Dr. Jernigan, Dr. Franklin Scott, Dr. John Jernigan, Dr. Franklin Scott, Dr. Clement Palmer, the psychiatrist, and Dr. Angel Lennon, uh, the therapist, will be here with us on Wednesday. That'll be live radio, too, so that's on Wednesday. Interestingly, uh, as I awakened this morning, uh, or as I got up this morning, I had awakened much earlier, about 6.30, I turned the news on, and I heard since the pandemic, suicide rates are up 50%. Suicidal rates are up 50% since the pandemic. We're going to talk about that this week on Wednesday. And so I hope that you'll share uh, that Wednesday evening session with us right here at 6 o'clock uh, on Wednesday. Then Thursday evening, uh, we've got worship with the presiding elder Strickland at uh, beginning at 6 o'clock. Uh, and we hope you'll share that with So you'll get a chance to get a whole lot more this week. I'll have the regular study uh, on Wednesday morning. Uh, but remember, Vacation Bible School tomorrow night uh, and Wednesday night. And Wednesday night is live radio. And Thursday night is live worship uh, on all of our outlets. So we hope to see you there. Come in the storm is our subject. Father, thank you for the word of God that you have given the children of God everywhere around the globe. We're your believers. We appreciate you giving your son's life, and we appreciate you giving the Holy Spirit, and we appreciate you leaving us the word of God, uh, which is the standard always and forever uh, for the church. Bless us now with revelation and insight. In Jesus' name, we give you our thanks. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the way and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? All right, that's our lesson text for today. There are always storms uh, that come in our lives. I was 
attended the funeral services yesterday for a colleague and friend, and another colleague said to me, I was with him a day or so ago, and if you had told me uh, that he would not have made it the next morning, I would not have believed it, but that's a storm that came. And so while he had uh, a fellowship the day before, the next day we were in a storm because our friend and brother was gone. And so storms come. I'm going to come to that. I want to talk about uh, five things very quickly this morning, uh, maybe maybe five or to seven things, but I five principally. Number one, uh, the Bible says that the disciples followed Jesus into the boat. So I want to introduce our lesson by saying, follow Jesus wherever he's going. When Jesus got into the boat, the disciples followed him. It's critical that we follow Jesus with all the legislation that's going on, with all the philosophical uh, jargon and philosophical ideas that are being ex uh, expounded upon and that we're being as exposed to with all of uh, the different uh, cultural diversities and practices and, and doctrines that are not based in scripture and all the other things. Uh, morality has changed. There are a lot of different dynamics going on right now. I'm going to insist as a man of faith and of, as Jesus' disciple that you follow Jesus wherever he leads you. Wherever he goes, go with him. Now, the way we find out how to follow Jesus is through the Bible. And so uh, there are a lot of things happening that do not represent following Jesus. Now, I'll just say quite honestly, as a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, this is our standard. For every Christian uh, believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible is our standard. And it really doesn't matter whether you're supposed to be uh, Protestant or Catholic. This is the standard. It's considered our canon, our rule, our authoritative rule. And so when something comes out that's against our authoritative rule, or canon, then we certainly uh, are not bound to follow that. And if we're following all of the different ideas that are being espoused to us from society right now, because this group is bent one way and that group is bent one way, and everybody's trying to sway you to go one way or the other way, I want to say to you, follow Jesus wherever he goes. The disciples got into the boat to follow Jesus. That was a great hymn of the church. I should have looked it up and uh, maybe read a few stanzas. It says, where he leads, I will follow. Where he leads, me, I will follow. And I'll go with him, with him all the way. So that uh, that song does have in it. I'll go with him in the garden. That was a place, uh, a prayer place uh, where Jesus was in anguish, a place where he experienced extreme sorrow. But the hymn writer said, I'll even go with him in the garden because Jesus is so valuable to us, we believe we're to go everywhere he leads us. So uh, standing up for truth uh, does not always get you accolades, does not always uh, get you an, an applause, uh, an ovation, but listen to this, it will win you favor with God, and you will be found obedient to him. And so follow Jesus, that's number one, wherever he goes. Here's number two. The lesson is about calming the storms. And so num the second dynamic, formidable storms can suddenly come. I, I said I'd come back to that. Uh, my colleague and I were talking yesterday uh, as we were waiting for uh, the final services of the Reverend Dr. Farrell Duncan to take place. And he was saying to me, Claude, I was with him uh, a day before, and I never thought that that was my last day. And of course, uh, uh, we're all a little devastated with that. But listen to this. That's a storm. Our formidable storms can come. Well, it was worse, of course, for uh, the immediate family. Uh, who did not expect him to be gone. Probably even worse for uh, Sister Juanita Duncan, who did not know that night when they prayed uh, that would be his last prayer. 
that she would hear. What a formidable storm. Uh, you know, I want to say something uh, about that in a minute. I'm going to come back to that. I want to say to you, love the people you love. Be good to the people uh, that are around you in your families because you don't know when a storm is coming. Storms uh, can suddenly come. Uh, we used to be, I used to be a, a little Sandlock baseball player. Uh, didn't play for the school, but I, you know, could have played for the school, but I didn't want to. But I remember how uh, storms, you could see them coming. Uh, Sometimes you could see the storm coming and you get these warnings. You could hear uh, the storm from a distance. And sometimes we stay out and try to play a little more baseball or a little more basketball, a little more football, whatever we were doing. Or if you were in the field, uh, maybe you tried to get a little more uh, work done in the field, but you could hear the storm coming. And it wasn't that you knew it was coming before you went to the field. It wasn't that you knew it was coming one hour before it came, maybe even 30 minutes before it came. But all, excuse me, of a sudden you heard the sound of a storm and of a wind and of a rain coming. And so you had to rush out of the field and rush off of the ball diamond because the powerful storm had suddenly come and ended all activities for that day. Now, I'm not talking about a sprinkle. No, it ended activities that day. It suddenly came. Sometimes it lingered but usually it drenched everything. It wet up everything around you and just soaked it so that all the activities outside were over unless you want to sit in water the rest of the day. Now, formidable storms, just like that natural occurrence, happens to us in life. Death is a storm. Uh, for, <coughs> excuse me, for some people, divorce is a storm. Uh, one person I counsel said, I, I got a text message that my uh, phone number was being changed or that a phone number or service was being changed. And when I saw the text message, I immediately went to find out what was going on. And the person said, and my spouse was leaving me. A formidable storm. Uh, devastation comes. Uh, you know, the house burned down. A, a robbery took place. Uh, a natural disaster came, a fire, uh, or a flood, or a tornado, devastation, sudden storms, uh, all kinds of disappointment. Sometimes it's disease. Uh, sometimes it's it's some addiction you found out about. As someone told me just this morning, uh, early this morning, about uh, eight o'clock, uh, as they were interrogating a family member and discovered that uh, a teenager was already using some form of drug. Uh, devastation, you know, all kinds of things happen. Formidable storms can suddenly come. And so stay with me because we got to talk about uh, the man who rules over every storm. Here's number three. Number one, uh, follow Jesus wherever he goes. Number two, formidable storms can suddenly come. They don't give you warnings. They're just bam, and they're here. Uh, number three, sometimes Jesus seems to be sleeping. Now, this is one of my favorite dynamics. Uh, I've preached before about uh, the silence of when when God says nothing or when Jesus says nothing. All of this stuff going on around you, and the Lord acts like he, he he's not concerned. He's apathetic, or he's not doing anything. At least you think he's not doing anything. Habakkuk the prophet thought he wasn't doing anything in Habakkuk chapter 1. But God said to Habakkuk, and we have to always remember this when we're in a storm, when it appears that Jesus is sleeping, uh, God said to Habakkuk, if I told you what I was doing, you would not believe it. But in other words, God was saying to his preacher, I'm already working. You cannot see me. You think I'm asleep. You think I'm apathetic. You're not giving me the proper credit because I am working. Now, the disciples uh, saw Jesus asleep in the storm, and so they went to petition the Lord, and they woke Jesus up. I want to say to you uh, in symbolic form, wake Jesus up. Wake Jesus up simply means 
Pray, saints. Pray. You get God's attention uh, by prayer and by fasting and by obeying him. You can always get God's attention by prayer and fasting and obeying him. So wake Jesus up, saints. Wake him up. Say, well, I just don't have time. I, somebody said, well, I, you know, I, I got so much to do. I really don't have time uh, for, for a Sunday school or prayer meeting or Bible study. You know, it's one of the worst lies we could tell. One of the worst lies we could tell is I don't have time uh, for prayer or for studies or for worship. Because when we're in a crisis, we always have time. When the storms of life come and beat upon us, we always have time. It doesn't matter what the schedule is there. We have, we always have time to pray. And so I want to say to you, uh, wake Jesus up. It is a, if it appears he's not answering, uh, keep praying. Call on him, wake him up. Here's number four. Let's go to number four. Jesus expects us to trust him in our storms. Now, uh, one of the difficulties we have is trusting Jesus in the storm. Do I trust Jesus when I'm going through to, to work this thing out for me? Do I trust him? All right. All of us can be challenged. There are some things I came to a point in life, I said to the Lord, okay, God, I'm giving it to you. I'm expecting you to make the, the difference. To, I'm expecting you to turn it around. I'm expecting you to change it. I'm expecting you to bring us out. I'm expecting you. I'm trusting you with the matter at hand. And so I gave him some things and said, God, you can work it out. And I've lived to understand I can trust Jesus. I can trust him to work it out. I can trust him to be on time. I can trust him to see me through. I can trust him. And so I want to say to you, expect Jesus uh, to work it out and trust him in the storm. Say, but Reverend Shiva, you're not going through what I'm going through. No, I'm not, but I've gone through enough things already to know that the Lord can be trusted when you are in a storm. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? What, what are you afraid about? And, and oh, you of little faith. Now listen to what the Lord says. He says to them, why are you afraid? And, and, and you have little faith. Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Wow. That's big. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, I'm right here and you are afraid. And I hear the Lord saying to us, I'm right here and you are afraid. He's not some uh, God far uh, uh, away from us. As Paul, Apostle Paul said, no. And he's not some God uh, who lives in a temple. No, uh, in him we live, move, and have our being. He's right here with us. We can trust him. Now, that takes faith to believe. He's right there where you are in the storm. You know, when I was in tears, I knew God was present. I've never been in a place where I felt like God was not present. No matter how bad my storm was, I always had faith. Even when I was crying buckets of tears, I cried my buckets of tears because I'm, I'm human, I'm emotional, I love, I hurt like everybody else. But I never cry hopelessly. I always know that the Lord is right here with me like he promised. And so I ask him to help me. There's a, a magnificent hymn that I love, uh, and sometimes I, I sing it. Uh, My heavenly Father watches over me. I, I believe that's, that's a trusting deal. Uh, God watches over us. Hallelujah. I know that I can't handle the things in life. I, I can't handle, uh, as I've said many times before, I couldn't have handled driving 40,000 miles a year and, and you're going and going and going and you've got all of these different dynamics going on. You've got your own personal life. You've got uh, your church life. you got family life. you got community life. you got a lot of different things. And I, I say to God, and I can't watch my back, but the Bible says God is our rear guard. So I expect God to do what he said in the word, watch over us. 
I, I can't watch over uh, my wife and my children and my grandchildren. I can't watch over them. I'm trusting that my heavenly father watches over me and watches over the congregation and watches over my family. You know, you got to trust God. You know, you could worry yourself to death, you know, but I'm not around twiddling my fingers and, and whittling the, uh, with the stick. No, I'm not doing that because I know it's better, as I said a week or so ago, if I trust God, then I'm not worrying about it. If I pray and trust God, don't worry. If I start worrying, I need to pray and trust God some more. If I worry, pray and trust God some more. Uh, if I pray and trust God, I'm not worrying. As the late Miss Olivia Boyd said, you can't do both of them at the same time. So every time you find yourself worrying, pray and trust God some more. Jesus, Jesus wants us to trust him. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord wants you to trust him. Now, we want people to trust us, right? We want people to trust us. Oh, yes, 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 I want Mount Zion to trust me, but I, I believe with all of my heart, after some years, they know they can trust me with some things, okay? Now, and by the same token, I believe uh, with all of my heart, and I do, I trust them uh, to do particular things for this ministry. Jesus expects us believers to trust him. Well, I, they let me down. You know, we will let each other down. And sometimes people will say the Lord let them down, but that's probably because they were asking for something the Lord was not willing to do. I trust him regardless of whether he does what I pray for or do not pray for because he's worthy to be trusted. He has my best interests in all things. He's working for my good. I never believe God is working against us. God is working for us. My God, if God was working against us, we would be a total failure. It would already be over. But God is working for us. Hallelujah. I feel that. I feel that God is working for us. You know, the naysayers say this. They say you can't do this. They say you can't do that. You're not going to be this. You're not going to be that. Uh, how do they know what God wants to do for you? How do they know what God's going to do for you? They don't know. And it doesn't matter if it's a preacher. It doesn't matter if it's a preacher, a principal, a professor, a parent, a physician, a psychologist. God knows what God has for you. And you've got to be the person to trust God and to work diligently and, and expect Jesus to come through for you. Somebody say, well, you're never going to get out of that situation. You don't know what I'm going to get out of because you're not in charge of the situation. You're not the Lord over the storm. Jesus is the Lord over the storm. And the storm is subject to him. So let, 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 me, let me get to the number five. And number five in the text is Jesus arises in the storm. You're waiting for him, keep waiting on him. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That's Isaiah chapter 40. Mounting up like wings as of eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. So sometimes you got to wait for Jesus to get up in your storm and handle the storm. Let me ask you a question. Can you wait? Let me ask you another question. Will you wait for him? Will you wait for him to come through in your storm? Or will you resort to something that you know could be detrimental for you? Will you wait for him in your storm? Yes, you can wait for him in your storm. You can wait for him in your storm. Hallelujah. Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind. He rebuked the sea and everything was calm. Now, uh, you, I, I read this, this wonderful hymn uh, earlier last week, uh, Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are tossing high. The sky is all shadowed with blackness. No help or shelter is nigh. Carries thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep when each moment so madly is threatening a grave in their angry deep? 
The winds and the waves shall obey my will. Peace be still. Peace be still. And so the hymn writer was saying uh, to the Lord, look, God, I'm in a storm. I'm in trouble. The waves are bad. The winds are boisterous. I'm perishing. And he then sings the chorus as Jesus is responding. The winds and the waves shall obey my will. I love that song. Because what the hymn writer was saying, Jesus is already saying to you, to you, to me, I'm in charge over the storm. The winds and the waves might be raging, but they will obey my will. Hallelujah. I'm going to the last thing. The, the lesson ends with the disciples are amazed. And they said to each other, what sort of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, it's interesting to me, this must have been early on, you know, because people are always amazed that Jesus was working miracles. You know, in this case, he, he's in charge of nature. Makes the wind shut up. Makes the wave be, waves be quiet. You know, another time out on the sea, he defies gravity. He starts walking across the water. And so they're always amazed at him because, listen, you're always going to be amazed at Jesus if you look at him. I'm amazed at him. I'm amazed at what the Lord does all the time. Uh, the Lord just brought back something to my, my mind uh, about 15 years or so ago. Uh, I was preaching down in Jefferson, Alabama, uh, and a lady came to me uh, with a deformed hand. Uh, I forgot what had happened to her hand. And she asked me to pray for her. She had very little usage in her hand because of whatever had happened. And you know, Jesus did something for that lady. The next year I went back to preach and she came back and she said, look at my hand. She said, I'm able to use my hand now. She said, you prayed for me and the Lord has restored usage in my hand. Now I was amazed just like she was amazed uh, because that's what the Lord does. He keeps amazing folk. You say, why do we pray? I pray because I've seen the Lord work miracles. I pray because I like to be amazed. Come on. He's done amazing things. And so I want to encourage you today. Don't give up in the storm. Don't commit suicide. I heard the message this morning. The suicidal attempts are up. 50%, you don't have to commit suicide. The Lord is here. He's here. He's right there where you are, and he's right here where I am, and he's right there where everybody else is because he's an omnipresent God. He's present in all places at the very same time, accessing. Beat on his door, knock on his door, call on him, petition him until he answers you. You can reach him. Say his phone line is never busy, the old folks say. Call him up and tell him what you want. Don't commit homicide. No, don't do it. The Lord is able to deliver you from that situation. Uh, the Lord just reminded me of a situation. I had a guest evangelist in town, and I carried him down to Raymond, Alabama uh, for a service. It was a wonderful service that night after the teaching and the laying on of hands and praying. Uh, a lady came up to us and said to us that night, she said, I was going home to kill my husband, but the Lord has spoken to me tonight. I'm not going to do it. And I want to say to you, homicide is not the answer. Suicide is not the answer. Going to get a fix is not the answer. Jesus can come to you in your storm. Paying somebody back is not the answer. 
He can come to you in the storm and he can calm your storm. I hope that you'll give him the opportunity. Bless your people, oh God, in the name of Jesus, amen. Hope to see you at 10 o'clock. My time is up. And so until the next time, until 10, that is, this morning, God bless you. This is Claude Schubert in Mount Zion. We love you. Hope you have a great week. Come on out to worship. We're outside under tents, and we're going to have a good time today. Bye-bye.